this next slide demonstrates how um, that action potential is actually opening up these channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So because of the fact that we have um, gating of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium cannot just leave the SR as it pleases, right? Calcium is withheld within the sarcoplasmic reticulum and there are certain gating mechanisms on the membrane of that SR that will then allow calcium to leave only when an action potential is propagated through this T-tubule. So we have this coupling of um, ryanidine receptors and DHP receptors. Two receptors that are found studded on the membrane of the SR, as well as the plasma membrane or the sarcolemma itself. So this is the membrane of the muscle fiber, which we call the sarcolemma. This is the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum where calcium is being stored. And so if we remind ourselves that calcium needs to move from the SR in blue out into the cytosol here in white in order to come in contact with that actin and to expose those binding sites. So the two receptors that are found in this membrane they actually control the opening of this channel, which allows that calcium to open up and flood the cytosol. So the T-tubule, right, the T-tubule shown here has the DHP receptor embedded in it. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane, I can never say that word, sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane has the ryanidine receptor embedded into it. And these two receptors are coupled to each other, meaning that they're touching each other and they're communicating. So when the action potential propagates down the T-tubule, it's going to come in contact with the DHP receptor first as it goes down the T-tubule. And then that is going to signal the ryanidine receptor, which is touching the DHP receptor, to open up this channel. So the ryanidine receptor is not only a receptor, but it's also a calcium channel. So when that action potential comes in contact here, it couples to the opening of that calcium channel, which brings calcium from the stored region here in the SR out into the, the cytosol, where it can come in contact with actin and actually start turning on muscle contraction. So this is how these two proteins are also involved in the regulation of um, this process. Okay. And as we talked about, in order for termination of contraction to be brought about, calcium must leave troponin and it must go back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It must leave the cytosol and it is done so actively. So there are active calcium ATPase pumps that are on the sarcoplasmic reticulum that is pumping these calcium, pumping this calcium back into the SR, and that is what is ceasing muscle contraction as uh, actin goes back into its um, relaxed state where those tropomyosin um, filaments are going to cover up the myosin binding sites once again. All righty, okay. All right, so I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions as we speak about this. Um, I don't see anything popping up. All right, now as I mentioned, we're not going to go into the mechanism of force generation. Um, and so the remaining slides, you can completely omit them for our purposes here. Um, and so I'm going to jump right over to our second packet.
Okay, so I'm going to move on now to look at smooth muscle, okay? So as I mentioned, we're gonna cut out a few things that are not too pertinent, and we're really gonna focus on the important parts of muscle physiology in an attempt to uh, get to the cardiovascular system, which I think is much more useful, much more important, um, particularly for doing well in AMP2 um, next semester. Um, so we're gonna look here at smooth muscle, um, and we're gonna speak about the mechanism of smooth muscle um, contraction, and really compare that to how that differs from the mechanism of skeletal muscle contraction. We're also gonna talk about the structure of smooth muscle, um, and then we're gonna compare that to cardiac muscle. So really um, zoning, in on, zoning in on the important parts of distinguishing between the three types of muscle in terms of their structure, and then distinguishing between um, the different contraction mechanisms for each of these muscle types. That's really where we're gonna focus our um, attention in terms of um, muscle physiology. So now we're gonna look at uh, smooth muscle. And I'll talk a little bit about how smooth muscle differs um, and how smooth and cardiac muscle um, compare to what we've discussed with skeletal muscle. Um, and then we're probably gonna pick this up um, when we meet on Wednesday. So smooth muscle, first off, it lacks striations. And we know that striations are brought about from the sarcomere, right? We talked about the structure of the sarcomere, these repeating units that are found along the myofibrils. And because smooth muscle does not have sarcomeres, it does not appear to be striated. And when I say striated, I mean it appears to have this string-like texture that we even see um, on, uh, on meat, right? When we look at the appearance of chicken or any other muscle tissue, we see the string-like appearance, and that is brought about from the striations um, which are created from the sarcomere. Smooth muscle does not have sarcomeres, and so it does not have that striated appearance. Um, it's found in internal organs and blood vessels. It's gonna be lining most of our body cavities, such as the GI system. It's found in the stomach, the esophagus, other hollow organs and blood vessels. And it is under our involuntary control. Um, we talked about this when we looked at the autonomic nervous system, we cannot control smooth muscle, unlike how we control skeletal muscle, we can voluntarily decide to move and think and talk and walk. Um, we cannot control our smooth muscle function. Now the cells of smooth muscle have a different shape. They're not elongated the way we saw with that muscle fiber. They're actually more spindle shaped, which you can see here um, on this image, right? They're kind of like um, spindles as we can see here, kind of flattened. And um, I wanna say like a spindle shape is the, the best way to describe that. Um, unlike this elongated um, striated uh, cell that we see in cardiac muscle as well as skeletal muscle. The cells of smooth muscle are much smaller, right, about one-tenth the size of skeletal muscle. Um, and as we can see here, they're much uh, smaller, but there are many more smooth muscle cells that are making up this smooth muscle. Um, so they don't have sarcomeres, but they do have what are called dense bodies. And dense bodies are these areas of connections. We can see here these connections that are going in between one cell and the other, and that's gonna be really important to the function of smooth muscle. So skeletal muscle kind of acts as a single unit, right? It um, has a single structure or a single muscle fiber, excuse me, that to some degree behaves independently of the other muscle fibers. It's innervated by a separate um, motor neuron or a motor end plate. It has its own neuromuscular junction. Whereas in smooth muscle, these areas of connections have gap junctions and that facilitates the communication of one smooth muscle cell to the other. So that's gonna be really important in creating this synchronous contraction that we see with some types of smooth muscle. So those are a few of the differences that we see between skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. Um, 
Now I'll point out here that gap junctions are seen in smooth muscle, but they're also seen in cardiac muscle. So we don't see them in skeletal muscle. Um, and so there are different features that are overlapped between um, different muscles, right? So we have voluntary control over skeletal muscle, not we don't have voluntary control over smooth and cardiac muscle. We have gap junctions in smooth and cardiac muscle and none in skeletal muscle, but we have sarcomeres in smooth, in skeletal and cardiac muscle, excuse me, and no sarcomeres in smooth muscle. So what I often encourage students to do is create a Venn diagram, and I'll probably um, uh, look at one of these as we review this later on, but a good study tool is to create a Venn diagram where you put features of skeletal muscle, features of smooth muscle, features of cardiac muscle, and then fill in those areas of overlap with the features that may be shared with, let's say, smooth and cardiac, or smooth and skeletal, or cardiac and smooth, and kind of distinguish what are the unique features of each and what are the shared features with some of the other types. That's a good way to really um, study and make sure you have an understanding of the features um, and are able to compare each of these types of muscle. 